Um, so I'm one of the project leaders for the, the WASP um, Venom Genome Project. Um, and so what I wanna do is, is not really talk specifically about that project today, but talk more about the research that's going on in my lab and then kind of give some um, feedback on how the, the work that GEP students do in their classes is actually feeding into um, the bigger research goals that we have. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm, I'm Nate. Um, I'm at University of, or sorry, Illinois State University. Um, and my contact information is here. Um, and so, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about um, a couple of, of projects going on in the lab um, that are kind of comparative and functional genomics type research. Um, so in the lab, we are really interested in understanding host pathogen interactions. Um, and so when we think about these interactions, we think about sort of the host is the organism that gets infected and it has to mount some type of immune response to eliminate that pathogen. And then the pathogen is the thing doing the infecting. Um, and what's really interesting is that these pathogens have evolved to be able to target specific hosts. Um, and by target, they're actually able to manipulate the signaling of their hosts. And so this is, I'm a cell biologist, and so this is what I'm really interested in is, is thinking about how um, pathogens are able to manipulate signaling in their host cells. Um, and the system we use, uh, the host, is Drosophila melanogaster. Um, most people are, have at least passing familiarity with. Um, but they're a great host to use. So we know an awful lot genetically and genomically about Drosophila. Um, we have lots of tools that we can use to, to manipulate them. Um, they're also very, have highly conserved signaling pathways with, with human and human disease related pathways. Um, and so as a result, they're commonly used for biomedical research. And, and you'll see a couple of projects I'm gonna talk about today. We're actually using Drosophila models of human diseases um, and then using, studying that in, in an immune context. Um, and Drosophila, you know, being insects have, have their particular life cycle over here. Um, it doesn't really matter a whole lot to understand the talk. Everything that I'm talking about is happening during these larval stages. So this is kind of a, as the organism is developing, they're getting infected and fighting off that infection. Um, so if you're, if you are a Drosophilist, you kind of know where we're getting at. Um, and if not, I'm happy to talk more about, about different aspects of the project later. Um, and so flies are great for studying immune responses because they get infected by kind of the same range of pathogens that we do. Um, and they mount pretty conserved responses to those, right? So their, their antiviral immunity looks quite similar to ours, um, antimicrobial. And then um, they also get infected by parasites. And, and when they're infected by parasites, the immune response they mount is driven by um, immune cells. And that's what I'm particularly interested in is, is sort of understanding what's happening in those cell types. Um, and so that's the, that's the system that we kind of focus in on. Um, and so the pathogens that we're studying are these parasitoid wasps. Um, and so the species we study, I don't know, about eight or 10 different species in the lab. Um, and the species that we study are all obligate parasitoids of Drosophila, right? So that means they need a Drosophila host to complete their um, developmental cycle. Um, these wasps infect flies using their ovipositor, right? So kind of the, the wasps and the bees that we're more familiar with are, you know, stinging us and, and causing pain, um, that stinger is actually a modified ovipositor. And, and in these more ancestral species, they use that stinger to lay their egg in the host. Um, and they also transfer venom proteins in. Um, and we're really gonna focus in on those venom proteins today. Um, and I will also say that I've been using the terms parasite and parasitoid. Um, there is a little bit of difference between them. A parasitoid is a parasite that kills its host on purpose. Right? We all know that there are parasites that kill their host as just a byproduct. They don't mean to. Um, this is a situation where actually killing the host is part of, of the parasite completing its life cycle. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and this is kind of the, the artist's interpretation of what happens, right? So we have our larval Drosophila, um, which is just a wonderful bag of, of the cells and proteins. Um, and the wasp actually comes, uses its ovipositor to pierce the cuticle and it's, it lays its egg right into this, this body cavity, right? So every, all, everything is kind of happening in this environment where the egg is being laid. Um, and so that's how flies are able to sense it and mount an immune response to it. Um, the immune response, we call it encapsulation. 
Um, I won't sort of dwell on the stages today. This is another branch of our research is, is sort of focused on understanding how a lot of these immune events happen. Um, but to think of it in really basic terms, um, the cells have to sense that there's been an infection. They have to find their way to the invader. And then once they get there, they bind to the invader and actually form this capsule around it. Um, and that capsule melanizes and that kills the, the wasp. Um, and so down on the bottom here is, is a fly larva that's been infected a couple of times. And you can see these melanized eggs are the result of a successful immune response, right? So this, this fly larva is gonna live, it's killed off its, its parasites. Um, of course, the, the wasp is not a fan of this immune response, right? And so um, they have evolved to try to evade this encapsulation response. Um, and if they're able to ev evade the response, they will continue their development inside the host. Um, they actually live in the hemocele of their host. They will kind of drink the fluids that are available to them. Um, and then once they reach a certain developmental stage, they'll actually start um, eating the fly's tissues. And so we have kind of an alien situation where the parasite is growing inside and then it eats its way through. But of course it then turns around and eats everything else as well. Um, so it's even a little bit more, more gruesome than the movies, um, but it, it makes for a really, I think, compelling system to, uh, to work with. Um, and a little bit of terminology, right? So a lot of these wasps have kind of evolved to target specific hosts. And so when we're talking about a, a wasp that has evolved to um, successfully parasitize a particular host, we would call that a virulent wasp. And if we have a mismatch where the host is gonna win, we'll call that avirulent. Um, and so we'll, we'll kind of use both of those terms again in a little while. So just to kind of get you oriented, virulent means the wasp is gonna win, avirulent means the wasp is gonna lose. All right, and so you know, how, how do wasps actually get around the immune response? Um, and they do it through their venoms, right? So we're, we're back to our artist interpretation. So not just the egg going in alone, um, the wasp is actually injecting um, venom at the same time into the host. Um, and this venom is, is full of proteins. We'll talk about it a little bit more here, um, but it has all the necessary ingredients um, to be able to in some way inhibit the host's immune response. Um, it also manipulates its metabolism. Um, it changes the developmental trajectory of the host. Um, so with just this handful of proteins, the parasitoid is actually able to um, really manipulate and take over its host. Um, so it, it makes for a very interesting system because we kind of have a closed system now where the parasite has put in a handful of proteins and we can study what those proteins do kind of within, within the fly. Um, yeah, and so what we're really interested in is, is kind of understanding this interaction between um, the immune response on one hand and then the, the virulence factors contained in the venom on the other. Um, and then a couple of the big questions of the lab. Um, one is thinking about how this could evolve, right? And so we're interested in that both kind of in a functional way, um, but also genomically, how that evolution has happened, the origin of the genes that we're looking at. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we're, we're really interested in kind of the biomedical side um, and thinking about how we can use this system to learn more about diseases that have an immune component. Um, and the diseases that we're working on in the lab right now are Alzheimer's disease, um, various autoimmune diseases, and then various cancers like epithelial cancer and, and leukemia. Um, and today I'm gonna to tell you about a couple of these projects. Um, but first we'll kind of talk a little bit more about venoms and where they come from, um, mainly because one of my master students took this picture last year and I can't get enough of it, so I try to use it as much as possible. Uh, but this is a confocal image um, of a venom apparatus that's just been stained for phylloidin. Um, so we can kind of see some of the structures. Um, and I will, without messing up the slides, I'll try to, uh, to walk you through it. Um, so this is, as a whole, we call this the venom apparatus. So this is dissected out, out from a wasp. Um, here's the ovipositor here. Um, so this is kind of the, the back end, um, the business end of a wasp. Um, the first thing to point out up here is the venom gland. And this is the structure where all of the um, venom genes are transcribed and where the proteins are translated, um, but they're not stored there. So they get translated, they get um, secreted from the cell in some kind of a way, and we're working on understanding the different um, 
secretion mechanisms, um, but they end up in this duct here. And this duct actually carries them down into the venom reservoir. And this is kind of the, the storage bag. So this is where all the venoms are, are held before infection. Um, all this is adjacent to what we call the ovarian cavity. So the ovaries of the wasp would be you know, out here somewhere connected into it. And this is kind of the chamber, right? So when a wasp is getting ready to infect, it gets an egg in the chamber. It has some venom ready to go. Um, and if you're kind of used to looking at phloidin stains, you probably notice this hat looks like there's some muscle on the outside of this. Um, and there are actually neurons on the ovipositor that fire when the ovipositor is inside the environment of the host. Um, so it can sort of sense hemoseal. And then that sends an action potential, which makes all of these muscles contract. And that's how it's able to squeeze one off into the host. Um, and that's kind of how infection happens. Um, but we're interested in studying these venom proteins. Um, and so we can actually do experiments using directly using the venom proteins by dissecting out this apparatus and then just opening the venom reservoir. Oops, I always do that, sorry. And then the venoms will all kind of leak out of the reservoir. Um, we can separate them just by centrifuging away from all the cells. And then we have purified venom that we can do experiments with. Um, and so of course, one of the things we did was we wanted to figure out what proteins were in the venom. Um, and so we did this by using mass spectrometry. Um, so I have some collaborators at the University of Alabama who, who run a mass spec center. Um, and so we've done mass spec on all of the venom proteins. We've also sequenced the genomes and the transcriptomes of three species of wasp that we work with. Um, and so that's kind of summarized here. Uh, so we have our three different species and then how many transcripts we got out of each one and how many venom proteins we got out of each one. Um, and then of course, my, my, my friends who helped do, do the work originally. Um, all right, so then what we can do is, is we can take all of this data um, and use it to do gene annotations, right? So a lot of you are kind of familiar with this. This is the process of um, taking all of this raw data and being able to um, figure out what sequence is actually composing a complete gene model so we can get full length transcripts and, and full length proteins, um, which we didn't get from just sort of looking at the raw data, right? So the annotation step is really what lets us um, study these genes and, and, and their full length sequences. Um, and so what we're really interested in is um, these venom proteins that are targeting conserved signaling pathways. Um, and we really wanna understand how that is happening. Um, and then the gene annotation where, where that's coming in is, is it's letting us build these full length gene models um, that we're gonna use to sort of analyze the evolution, um, but they also are full length sequences for us to um, synthesize proteins and do molecular biology experiments with them. All right, and so the, I kind of alluded to a couple of areas of research in the lab. Um, and so we're gonna kind of talk through each of these three to give you a, a sense of, of what we're doing. Um, the first one is going to be looking at comparative genomics um, between the wasp species. And we think we found kind of an interesting group of proteins. Um, and that's what the, all of the current um, annotation projects are, are a part of this project. Um, and then I'm going to talk about two of the human disease models we've been working on. Um, one in particular is, is very tightly linked to the GEP project as well. So we kind of want to talk about that one a little bit too. Um, all right, so first up, when we're thinking about, you know, comparative genomics, we have to think about the species that we actually want to look at. Um, and so we have our three species um, that we study in our lab are, are the two Leptoplanus species and then Gnaspis. Um, and then Nasonia is another parasitoid wasp that's more distantly related. And so we kind of use that as our outgroup. Um, and for all four of these species, we know the venom content, and it's, you know, somewhere around 160 proteins in each one. Um, so they're all fairly similar, um, but what's interesting about it in particular is the type of parasite they are. So we haven't really talked about this yet, um, but you know, I told you that our wasps are laying the egg directly in the hemoseal of the host. Um, and so we call that an endoparasite, right? So that egg is going directly into the host body. Um, it's having to deal with the host's immune response. Um, the other option is to be an ectoparasite where the egg is laid on the surface of the host. And then it's only after the egg hatches and the parasite starts developing that it actually is going to be interacting with the host physically. Um, and so that 
is an entirely different type of interaction. And so we'd imagine their venoms would be quite different. Um, and so that was kind of our, our starting point. And so I had a student who was interested in this and, and, and she was doing a lot of um, comparisons between these species. And she identified 36 gene families um, that are shared across all three of the species that we're studying and that are not in Missonia. Um, and so what we think is this is some sort of ancestral group of proteins that might be required either for endoparasitism, right? So we would imagine that that would translate roughly to the ability to live, to deal with a host immune response. Um, it could be more specific to affecting Drosophila since these are all Drosophila wasps. Um, we have to find some endoparasites that have different hosts to, to kind of narrow that down a little bit more. Um, that's something I'd like to do one day, but we're not really set up for non Drosophila hosts right now. Um, and so we're very interested in, in trying to understand these ancestral venoms. It's, we've started calling them ancestral, even though it's you know, obviously derived since the evolution of parasitism. Um, if we look a little bit closer at what we found, um, so a lot of them, about half of them, are um, what look like metabolic enzymes um, and that do a wide range of metabolic functions. Um, there's a good bunch that are structural proteins of some sort. Um, we get a lot of tubulins and myosins and actins. Um, we can talk about, I have some ideas from, from work we've been doing that might explain why we're finding those things in venom, um, but they're everywhere, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then we found a few proteins that we think might be kind of the effectors. Um, and so the, the best known example is a protein called serpin, which is serine endoprotease inhibitor. Um, and these are known to be, um, to inhibit insect immune responses. A lot of insect immune responses are dependent on protease activity. Um, and so we know these are immune inhibitors. So it kind of makes sense that, you know, if you're evolving to take on an immune response, you might want to get some proteins in there that can inhibit that response. Um, and so what we're doing is, as part of this project, is that we want to um, annotate all of these venom sequences across our different species. Um, we also want to annotate any non-venom paralogs, right? So um, proteins that are being used for other functions in the wasp, um, but that are highly homologous to the venoms um, to help us understand the evolution a little bit better. Um, and so in total, we're trying to do about 300 different transcripts um, and so we like to annotate each one twice. So that's about 600 annotations that we have to do. Um, and we're about 25% of those are done or in progress right now. Um, so we're, we're making pretty good, pretty good progress on that. Um, and that's really from starting last, I guess in the spring is when we first started working on these. So we're going, we're going a pretty good clip um, to be able to get all of these finished. And some of the questions that we want to answer with these gene models um, so obviously we're interested in, in the phylogenetics of it, right? We have our hypothesis that these are um, a set of proteins that evolved to allow for um, endoparasitism to evolve. Um, and so we wanna look to see if the venom proteins we're seeing, particularly compared to the non-venom versions, is this pointing towards um, evolution in the common ancestor, or might we be looking at convergent evolution? Um, and so far from our limited look, um, it seems like we have examples of both of those among the proteins. So it's gonna be interesting, I think, to look at those in a little bit more detail. Um, we're also interested in functional annotation. Um, so when you think about a, um, a protein going into a host, trying to act as a virulence factor and in some way manipulate that host, um, you could imagine a lot of scenarios where making a slightly dysfunctional version of a normal cellular protein might be a good way to go. So constitutively active or dominant negative version of a protein. Um, and so we want to take the sequences that we get and kind of look for evidence that might um, point us towards um, proteins with altered regulation as something that we could then test in the lab. Um, and then of course, we're also interested in the, in the origin. Um, so we found examples of what appear to be venom specific splice forms. Um, there appear to be gene duplications where we have a venom version and non-venom version. Um, there are some multifunctionalized proteins that act both in a cellular context and a venom context. And so we're really interested in kind of building um, out the, the full library of these sequences so that we can 
um, look across all of these different things and, and really get a feel for what's happening. Um, and so it's really gonna be those um, GEP student generated gene models that are gonna let us answer these questions. All right, I'm gonna take a quick sip. All right, and so then the, the other side of the lab, um, kind of moving away from more of the evolution side and thinking about the biomedical side um, is looking into some human disease models. Um, so I said, we're interested in looking at um, diseases that may have an immune component. Um, and so we're gonna talk about two of the things that we're studying today. We'll talk first about leukemia, and then we'll talk a little bit about Alzheimer's disease. Um, so when you start studying leukemia, the first thing that jumps out is a pathway that's called the JAK-STAT signaling pathway. Um, so we'll kind of introduce that and then talk a little bit about the disease model. Um, so JAK-STAT pathway is uh, a very simple pathway. Um, half of the genes are in the name, so I'm, I'm kind of a fan of that. Um, and this is just an example of the pathway here. Um, so this is a pathway that is activated by cytokines. Um, and in Drosophila, the cytokines that activate it belong to the UPD family, the unpaired family. Um, the cytokine receptor is called domeless. Um, and so when it receives the cytokine signal, it activates the JAK kinase, which implies it's called hopscotch. Um, JAK phosphorylates the transcription factor STAT. And then after phosphorylation, STAT is able to go into the nucleus and drive gene expression. Um, and we know it drives the expression of a lot of genes that are relevant to things that we're interested in. Um, so this JAK-STAT pathway is involved in production of immune cells. Um, it's also involved, we found that it's involved in the priming of immune cells to be able to respond to a pathogen. Um, and so we think it's doing a lot of important things potentially in, in immune cells. Um, and then the reason this ties into leukemia is that um, gain of function mutations in JAK-STAT are linked to a lot of human diseases, um, and in particular leukemia. Um, I think there's an estimate that about 80% of patients with acute leukemia have a gain of function mutation in JAK, one of the human JAKs. Um, and so we're very interested in kind of studying it from that context. Um, it's also linked to a lot of autoimmune diseases, which we're interested in. Um, but for today, we're going to kind of focus on the, the leukemia side. Um, and so we've been able to isolate a Drosophila model of leukemia. Um, this is a gain of function mutation in JAK, so very similar to um, the human disease causing mutation. Um, that same mutation in a fly leads to leukemia like phenotypes, right? So they're going to produce a lot of excess blood cells. Um, it's associated with um, wasting of body mass. Um, and it can also be lethal. Um, and this phenotype is, is, or this mutant is nice to work with. It has a very easy to score phenotype. Um, so you can see here, all of these little melanizations that appear. Um, and this is as a result of the um, excess production of blood cells. Um, it's similar to the melanization of a parasite, um, only here it's undirected. And so you get these little melanizations all throughout. And so the first thing that we wanted to do um, before we got too carried away was actually to see if the JAK-STAT pathway has anything to do with our system. Um, and so to test this, we used a, what we call a reporter, a pathway reporter. Um, and so I said that STAT was a transcription factor that can go in, that after it's activated, will go into the nucleus and drive transcription. Um, and so how this reporter works is, and the genome is a construct that has the binding sites for that transcription factor upstream of GFP. And so whenever the pathway gets turned on, we see expression of GFP. And so the cells are gonna fluoresce green. Um, and so we're, we have a really simple readout of pathway activity. Um, and it's also proportional, right? So the more signaling you get, the more intense the green is gonna be. Um, and so we did the, the simple experiment first and we just looked at immune cells. Um, and so if we look at immune cells of an uninfected larva, which is what I'm showing here, um, you can see the immune cells in the bright field and there's very little GFP, if, if any. Um, but then following infection, we get a really strong induction of GFP um, and pretty much all of the immune cells are, are, have this pathway activated. Um, and so you know, now that we know that the pathway is turned on in response to wasp infection, um, and we know that this pathway is involved in 
um, a lot of immune functions that we'd want those cells to do in response to wasp infection. Um, we kind of had the hypothesis that maybe um, the wasps may be interfering with this pathway in some kind of way. And so that's what we set up to test. Um, and so this is kind of what the, the data will look like. Um, so what we're able to do is to quantify the amount of fluorescence we get from the cells and then just plot that, right? So what we have here is the fluorescence on the Y and then our different species across the X. Um, so first I'll just show you when we infect these um, reporter flies with an avirulent wasp, right? So remember this is a wasp that will lose against the fly. Um, so it's not blocking the immune response we get a really strong induction of GFP. So we think the pathway is turned on to really high levels. Um, if we infect these reporter flies with a panel of virulent wasps, um, almost all of them are inhibiting the signaling. Um, so that was really exciting to find um, that we think that what that's telling us is, is that a lot of the wasp species that have evolved to um, infect Drosophila and Lanagaster have evolved to block this pathway in some kind of a way. Um, and so we're really interested in, in understanding how that could work. Um, and so, of course, the next thing we wanted to do was to look specifically at our disease model, our leukemia model, and see if any of the wasps are able to um, influence the, the phenotype that we see there. Um, and so, as a reminder, this is the phenotype. So wild type has no melanization. Um, the, the leukemia mutants have quite a bit of melanization. And so all we did was score a bunch of pupil cases, which is what these are, um, to see if they have melanizations or not. Um, and so again, we're looking at different wasp species across the X, and then the penetrance of the phenotype, so between zero and one. Um, and when we look at our controls, or either of the avirulent wasps, we see it's somewhere around 80% of the pupil cases that are showing the phenotype. Um, and then what we find from, from looking at our virulent wasps is a couple of them are actually really, really good at preventing this leukemia phenotype. Um, so, you know, if they weren't killing the fly, you would say that infection is great for the fly. Um, obviously, in the long run, it's not, but it is at least blocking this, this um, leukemia-like leukemia phenotype. Um, and so we're really interested in, in understanding that. Um, and yes, yeah, so we found all these different species that are acting in different parts of the pathway. Um, we're really focusing in on those species that are blocking the leukemia model because um, we know they're doing something central to the pathway. Um, and unfortunately, those are the two, the two species, two of the species we haven't sequenced yet. Um, so right now we are collecting samples. So we're, we're making genomic DNA um, and RNA extractions and extracting venom. Um, and so we're going to be sequencing those and, and having those as annotation projects over the next couple of years. Um, we're also doing some in vitro assays to try to purify this activity. Um, so we have fewer candidates to look at when, uh, when the time comes. Um, and we think this is interesting because we have found a system that has evolved to block gain of function jack stack signaling, um, which is linked to lots of different human diseases. And so we're really interested in, to understand how that may be happening. All right, okay. and then the, the final thing. Oh. Did I have a question that? from Rama. Are these oh. general insect cells like S2 or specifically isolated Drosophila cells? Um, so they, these are um, cells that are isolated from infected Drosophila larvae. Um, so these are like primary immune cells. Um, we haven't tried it with S2 cells yet, but S2 cells are um, hemocyte-like cells from embryos. Um, was kind of how they were originally isolated. Um, and so it's likely that they would work in similar ways, uh, but we haven't, we haven't tested that too closely yet. Um, yeah, so these are, these are cells that are um, isolated from infected larvae. So this is kind of the, the thing it's actually encountering. And, and making those primary, primary cultures is really simple. Um, you can just you know, tear open a larva and they bleed out. So it's not a, we call it dissection, but it, it's not quite that taxing <laughs> compared to a lot of other dissections. So it seemed like, I, I think in the beginning you said you had three proteins that seemed from the venom that seemed to be involved in immune function or suppression or in that case. Have you tried immunodepleting those at all and seeing um, if you'll get the same effect as what you're saying? So not, not with those. 
Um, and those are, that's just sort of among that ancestral group of proteins. Um, it seems as though a lot of the immune inhibiting um, proteins are not sort of in that group. They're, they're more specific to the different species, um, which makes sense because they do have different host ranges and things. Um, we have done some experiments with other venom proteins where um, using pharmacological inhibitors, um, we're able to modify venom phenotypes. Um, we, haven't, we haven't tried that in this system yet. We're trying to understand a little bit more about, about it, um, but that's definitely a way we're interested in going is, is trying to um, see if we can interfere with, the, with this activity in some kind of a way. Uh, Nate, do you uh, separate your cells, larval cells, by fax or anything like that? Um, not for these experiments. Okay. Um, if we want, if we need a, a really pure population for for anything, we we will. Um, a lot of times, just um, bleeding them under mm -hmm. oil is enough to get a pretty good separate, like a, a pretty good prep of them. Um, you can also spin through a sucrose gradient to get rid of a lot of the, the other junk that comes out. Okay. Um, but we're able to visually identify the immune cells compared to other cell types really easily. Um, and so if we're just doing an imaging type thing, we don't really worry too much about it. Okay. All right, so the, the other project that I'll tell you a little bit about is um, work we're doing on Alzheimer's disease. Um, and this is kind of looking at autoinflammation and Alzheimer's disease. And so I'll kind of set up um, what the theory is we're interested in testing first, and then kind of go through some of the work that we've done. Um, all right, so uh, I imagine everyone is familiar with Alzheimer's disease. Um, if not, this is um, one of the major forms of dementia. Um, it's neurodegenerative disease, so it leads to um, loss of cognitive function and, and eventually dementia. Um, millions of people are affected by it. Um, at a molecular level, this disease is characterized by the formation of what we call amyloid plaques and then neurofibrillary tangles. And those two things seem to happen in that order with the plaques appearing first. And something about the presence of the plaques is allowing the tangles and combine these two um, things are driving the pathogenesis of, of Alzheimer's disease. Okay, and so when we're thinking about these amyloid plaques, um, they're made up of a peptide co called amyloid beta, or just A beta, um, which is how you'll normally see it written. Um, let's talk really briefly about this. So A beta comes from um, the cleavage of a precursor protein, which is APP, amyloid precursor protein. Um, and this protein is particularly interesting. It's, it's cleaved by three different enzymes, three different proteases. Um, to give the final peptide products. And the first two of these enzymes are actually mutually exclusive. So only one will be able to cut the precursor. And depending which of those two make the first cut, you get different final products. Um, and so there's the alpha cleavage pathway. And I will say that other than what I'm gonna tell you about A beta, we don't know a whole ton about what any of these other peptide products do. Um, that's just another project in the lab as we're starting to try to understand those a little bit more using a Drosophila model. Um, but there's the alpha cleavage, and as far as we know, all of the products of alpha cleavage are awesome and enhance memory and do all of these wonderful things in, in mouse models. Um, the beta cleavage is completely different. The beta cleavage is what leads to the production of A beta, and A beta is what can then um, oligomerize to form these plaques that, that can sort of kick off the Alzheimer's pathogenesis. Um, but in general, we don't know a whole lot about what A beta does or you know, why, why you would want this other pathway. Um, what we do know is it's been linked to immunity. Um, and we also know that autoinflammation, which is kind of a um, generic riling up of the immune response, um, and targeting soft tissue is, is somehow involved in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so kind of all of these little bits and pieces together um, have led to this, what we call the immune theory of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I'll say that this was pro first proposed um, several years ago um, 
and at the time by by Rob Moore was the guy's name. Um, and when he first came up with this idea, apparently everyone else in the field thought he was nuts. Um, I, I'm not an Alzheimer's disease researcher. I kind of got into it through this, this immune connection. Um, one of my friends is, and, and he said that for years, everyone thought this guy had no idea what he was talking about. And now I went to the Alzheimer's disease meeting last year and pretty much every talk is about immunity in some kind of general way in Alzheimer's disease. So sometimes the people who you think are crazy are maybe just a little ahead of, ahead of their time. So there's still hope for me, I think. Um, but anyway, what this theory is, is that um, following infection, um, the host, the infected host, is going to upregulate this beta enzyme, so it's called BASE, that does this beta um, cleavage, which leads to the production of amyloid beta. Amyloid beta is going out and doing immune things that are good, and that is helping you overcome whatever pathogen infection you have. Um, but then you kind of hit this branch in the road, right? So if you're able to effectively clear the A beta that was made as part of the immune response, then you're going to recover and everything is fine. Um, if you're not able to clear it, um, and a lot of the genetic risk factors for developing Alzheimer's disease are actually part of this beta amyloid um, clearance mechanism. So if you're not able to clear it, the idea is it's going to hang around um, in the brain in between neurons, building bigger and bigger plaques and, and eventually causing damage and leading to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so we're obviously this is an exciting thing to think about. Um, and so we sort of tested two parts of this theory in the lab, and I'll kind of tell you a little bit of data about both of those. Um, the first is just, is there any basis for it? Is, is amyloid beta actually doing anything in an immune response? Um, and so we were able to test this by using flies that um, are not able to make amyloid beta. Um, and so when we infect these with an avirulent wasp, um, they have no immune response, which was really exciting. Um, so what we're looking at in the graph here, um, on the y-axis is the um, in percentage of eggs that get encapsulated, right? So that's a successful fly immune response. Um, and the, this is control and then um, the precursor protein mutants, um, both infected with an avirulent wasp, right? So this is a wasp that's generally gonna lose. You can see in the control, the control flies are winning about 80% of the time. Um, and our mutants are never able to complete encapsulation. Um, I had uh, an undergrad student who started this and a couple of grad students are working on it. And I think between them, they've probably looked at hundreds and they haven't found a single encapsulation yet. So we're pretty excited about what's happening here. Um, but of course, there's lots of ways you can screw up an immune response. And so we wanted to, to get a little bit more information in that. Um, and so what they did was they did those same round of infections. And then rather than waiting to look at an endpoint, they actually dissected along the way to look at what's going on. Um, and so across the top, you can see what happens in a control fly, right? So um, from left to right, we're looking at time post-infection. Um, and so early on, we have wasp egg developing. It keeps going. You see it starts forming a little wasp inside there. Um, but you also see the melanization starting, right? So this, this fly has formed a capsule and started melanizing. And then by three days or by two days, it's completely melanized. Um, and so this is a fly that's one. Um, when we look at our um, APP mutants, we see, you know, it looks the same through the first couple of ages, but we never see that capsule forming. We never see melanization happening. Um, and after a couple of days, we actually have a wasp larva that's hatched out of the egg. And as soon as that happens, it's kind of game over for the fly um, because this guy will go on to win. Um, and so what we can conclude from this, or what, what, what this led us to start thinking about is that um, A beta might be acting as an opsonin. So opsonins are um, proteins in the immune response that serve as um, recruitment signals, right? So they tend to be secreted proteins that will bind to the surface of a pathogen and basically put up a little flag, right? And so immune cells will know to look for opsonin flags and anything that has opsonin bound is a pathogen, right? And so we think that's what's happening here is, is the big difference is that we're losing these cells coming and binding and melanizing. Um, and so we're interpreting that to start thinking that maybe that means that um, 
the cells are no longer able to see the where the pathogen is. Um, and so we're doing some some more experiments now to, to try to form up that hypothesis a little bit. But that's kind of the way we're thinking about it is that that A beta is kind of acting as a danger signal. It's binding to the pathogen. It's recruiting immune cells. And so then the other thing we wanted to test is whether um, A beta, the ability to clear A beta is actually linked to phenotypes that are, are related to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so to do this, we're kind of using the, the typical Drosophila model of Alzheimer's disease, um, in which we can actually express the human A beta peptide in flies and see what happens. Um, and so, you know, people first started doing this, this 15 years ago now, um, and they found that if you express this A beta in neurons, you get what appear to be neurological phenotypes related to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so, you know, we were not so interested in what was happening there. We wanted to just see in general, is there some interaction of the immune response? Um, and so what we found is that if we express this protein everywhere, um, and then we infect the flies that are expressing it, we actually get this systemic auto-inflammatory response. Um, and so this is kind of the data across the bottom. So on the left here, these are larvae that are expressing human A beta that haven't been infected. Um, and if you haven't worked with these before, this is what happy, healthy larvae look like. Um, they're, they're in there wriggling around, um, doing larva things, um, and everything's fine. As soon as they're infected, so the same genotype, um, but infected, and you can actually see that all of them are picking up lots of melanization throughout. Um, and in insects, this sort of widespread melanization is, is indicative of a systemic inflammatory response. Um, and if you're used to looking at these, you'll also notice that they are a lot stiffer. And so we think that this is actually um, killing off either the neurons going to the muscles, body wall muscles, or the body wall muscles themselves, and, and that they're kind of paralyzing. Um, as a result of this inflammation. Um, so we think it's probably causing some kind of damage. We haven't really figured out exactly what it is yet. Um, so we're really excited to see if we build up really high levels of A beta in a fly, um, nothing happens until we stimulate the immune response. But once we stimulate the immune response, we get this really, really extreme um, inflammatory response. Um, I've, I've expressed plenty of proteins from other species and flies before, and I've never seen anything anywhere, anything like this at all. Um, so it's really, it's really kind of an exciting thing um, that obviously we're trying to work on a little bit more and understand what's going on. Um, and then of course, you know, one of the things we do in the lab is when we find something interesting that the fly does, we always look for a wasp that messes it up. Um, and so of course the students ran off and started infecting this model with different wasp species. Um, and so we found a couple of our, or of our virulent wasp species that actually inhibit this inflammatory response. Um, and so here we're looking at you know, the penetrance of the phenotype. Um, these are all the same genotype of flies. So flies expressing um, the human A beta in the same tissue to the same levels. Um, uninfected, there's nothing. Infect with A virulent, pretty much all of them have the phenotype. Um, and then a couple of our, our um, virulent species block it fairly close down to, to zero. Um, and so hopefully we are hoping that, that this means that um, there may be something in the venom that's actually able to interact with human A beta um, and prevent it from accumulating, right? So, so break it down in some kind of a way. Um, and so we're really interested in that. It's also possible the other idea we have is that um, it's blocking the ability of the immune cells to recognize the A beta plaques. Um, and that's something we would also be very interested in understanding. Um, so obviously I have a few students working on that one. Um, but kind of to, to think more about this idea of, of if there's something in wasp venom that's able to target human A beta. Um, we have some knowledge from, from other model systems um, about what kind of enzyme, what kind of proteases can actually target A beta. And we look at it and we find that there are um, proteins that are homologous to these found in the venoms of the two species that are able to block the phenotype. Um, and so, you know, of course, that's something we're interested in looking at more. Um, these are pretty big gene families. Um, and so across our three species, there are 
close to 30 genes in total that fit into this um, protease family. Um, and so that's some of the projects that students in, in GP classes are working on is um, to annotate all of these genes across the three species. Um, and what we eventually want to do is to be able to um, look at the relationships between them, right? So some of the questions I mentioned earlier, is this a convergent evolution? Is this representing a common ancestor? Um, are there potential functional differences in the venom specific version members of this family? Um, so we're really kind of interested in looking at that. And then what we want to do in the longer run is to um, synthesize the proteins that um, students have predicted with their gene models and actually test their activity against human A beta, see if they're able to interact with it, are they able to degrade it? Um, whatever else we can think of at the time, are they able to do it? Um, and I think that's kind of a nice, a nice way of, of um, showing how the models that students are making are kind of directly impacting on, on what we're doing in the lab. Um, so yeah, so basically that's all I wanted to talk about. Um, I do need to thank a lot of people obviously for this. Um, got funding from a couple of grants from the NIH to run, to run this research. Um, and then this is just a handful of the students that have been involved. Um, I wanna point out in particular, Chris, who did the beautiful picture of the venom gland um, Ashley is the, the student who um, did the ancestral venoms, and Emma over here was an undergrad in the lab who uh, started the Alzheimer's disease project. Um, and so I'm, I'm, of course, happy to take any questions that anybody has, and, and thanks again for, for coming and for listening.